Hi folks, John Dunn here, RPG freelancer, publisher behind Melly Via. I'm up here today with Mikey at Immortals. What is up, John? It's good to be here. How you doing? You know, after reading this book, I think I want to plan a trip. Really? Yeah, someplace far. I mean, you someplace know, that's going to take some time. Traveling's exhausting, but at the same time, it's so rewarding. We're going to need to take some vacations. So we might have to go a couple of weeks without don't recording. Don't let Carlos hear that, by the way. Uh, well, I mean, we're going to do that, so don't let him hear that. He's going to hear it anyways. So eventually, pay cuts incoming. <laughs> you may be sure. <laughs> so the one, the reason I'm talking about this is the game book I want to talk about today is Uncharted Journeys, and this is a supplement from Cubicle Seven that is for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. It's kind of tied into the work that they had done on Adventures in Middle Earth, which was their Lord of the Rings source book for D&D 5th edition. But since they don't have that license anymore, this is kind of an adaptation of that just to D&D 5th edition without those Middle Earth connections. Now, in fairness, I have done some freelance work for Cubicle 7. I had no involvement in this at all, though. Uh. And this uh, was funded on Kickstarter in September of 22. They raised about 49,000 euros. They had about 1,100 backers for it. And when this came out, when this was in development, it preceded all of those OGL issues from January of mm. this year. Uh, so this is released under the open game license, unchanged as things have continued so far. Nice. Uh, and there was a big team of folks at Cubicle 7 who did work on this. So props to them on that. Shout out. Uh, now, talking about this, when you think of The Hobbit, when you think of Lord of the Rings, both of those books involve the characters undertaking just enormous, long journeys, right? They're traveling far from home to go explore. And that's what this book sets up. When you think about the iconic Dungeons and Dragons settings, these places are massive, right? The Forgotten Realms is much larger than North America. Similarly, uh, I believe the iconic areas of even Dragonlance and Greyhawk are also just enormous places. And for the most part, you're talking about characters needing to travel those without advanced technology, right? They're using their feet, their horses, some kind of cart. Maybe if they're lucky, they've got a winged mount. But in any of those cases, they're not going real fast. And they may be going real far to get there. And this book solves the question of how do those kinds of journeys go? Exactly, because I feel like when you're in a normal campaign, you say you get from point A to point B, but it's never the in-depth of how you got there. Right. You, know, you just and, got there. And maybe you don't want it to be yeah. that in-depth, but this tool kind of gives you more than just hand-waving to do it. It gives you some very specific rules for doing that. Uh, the first way it does that is the very first chapter adds what's called a role. And that's role, R-O-L-E, much like in role playing, okay. right? This is another responsibility for the characters it's distinct from their class, but when they undertake the role, they get some special abilities that may kind of leverage off of their class for how they work when they're undertaking these journeys and how they coordinate with the other members of their party for that. The four roles are leader, and the leader kind of provides the inspiration for what's going on. The outrider, and the outrider kind of finds the route and the path of least resistance for the trip. The quartermaster, who's kind of the cook and the craftsman for fixing things, and the sentry who's a lookout. And just as I say that, I'm betting most people can think, well, obviously this one's going to be this character class. And yeah, there are links in there where maybe your ranger is particularly good at being an outrider or your bard is particularly good at being a leader. Uh, those roles kind of leverage, but they don't have to go that way also if they're pre-existing you can just assign it based off of what you think yeah and i mean if you've got an existing campaign and you decide to pick up this book it's real easy to just add those rules right nice. into an existing character it's huge. Right? uh chapter two is the journey rules and so when you undertake a journey you have to go through a series of steps the first one is to set the route and this is going to cover a distance and time frame from a trip of at least probably 50 miles, but it could go up to 1,000 miles. Uh, and then weather 
that they're going to encounter along the way and the type of terrain they're moving through are going to set a difficulty based on that combination of weather and time and distance that they're going. Uh, then the party needs to do some preparations before they undertake this journey, right? And when they do that, you're going to assign the different roles to each of the characters. They're going to use those role abilities to take some actions in preparation. Uh, and once they get going on that journey, they lose the ability to take long rests. Now, okay. in 5th edition D&D, a long rest is kind of a quintessential part of, you know, your life. That's how you get your spells back and how you do serious healing what and is, things like that. In layman's terms, what is what is, what, is, what is involved in a long rest? It, like Basically, it's we set up camp for the night. Okay. Right? And obviously, when you're on a journey like this, yeah, you're going to set up camp every night. But the point is that you're kind of coming up with a mechanic for how you don't have to do that. So... Instead of having long rests normally, there's game mechanics where your characters have to use their resources over the course of this extended journey. So once they've done this preparation, oh yeah, and they only get one short rest for the entirety of the journey. So then once they've done this preparation and they've allocated their assets, then they undertake the journey. And along the way, they need to deal with encounters. Uh, and the number of encounters is going to be based on the journey length, not surprisingly. They're going to need to make some checks based on the roles that they have within the journey group. And uh, those are going to set some modifier numbers. And then you're going to have encounters that are broken down based on the type of region. And this is actually really comprehensive. A big chunk of the book is setting up what types of encounters they're going to have based on the type of terrain and environment that they're traveling through. Uh, and then there's very clear-cut rules for the condition they're in when they arrive, what rewards they might attain, and how much things cost. And for the most part, that is going to be spelled out in terms of experience points. Chapter three covers people along the way. This is an NPC encounter generator. Uh, when you go through this, you're gonna end up with a time of day, a location, a background, and that background is gonna include a species, age, demeanor, and purpose. And then you get a bunch of example encounters that use these tables so you can very clearly see how they can be implemented. So you could just use those examples or you could go back and use the tables in the same way to set up encounters that match with those examples. Chapter four is ancient runes. These are basically, you know, runes that your characters are going to find. Weird outposts, ghost towns that they might find along the way of their travel. Uh, and then you've got... A section in here on who built it both that's going to cover both the species and the age so you know how old these runes that they've encountered are and then you get into what was the purpose that it was built for what's it currently being used for uh and you know this reminded me of pizza hut pizza hut pizza hut do you ever see a pizza hut restaurant that's been repurposed to be something else yeah so pizza hut just had this kind of iconic architecture that yeah, every like, single one of the restaurants were yeah. yeah it's got that kind of yeah. roof with that middle part that just sticks yep. up for no apparent reason now it's like a post office or yeah, something. yeah it can be anything right you can be driving <laughs> through and it's like oh look a fabric store well that used to be a pizza hut <laughs> or you know taco bell's kind of the same way if you see when yeah. it was built in the 70s and 80s yeah yeah i had visions of that when i was reading this chapter i was like oh well this is what it was originally built for but what's it being used for now and how are yeah. they using that iconic Pizza Hut yeah. architecture when they're setting this up. Yeah, good analogy. Right. Uh, chapter five is the journey encounter section. I mentioned this was a big chunk of the book earlier when I was talking about the types of encounters that the characters might have based on environment. Uh, and so you get 16 different regional environments that are detailed here. You get weather, flora, fauna, local inhabitants, points of interest, and possible journey tables for each of those 16 different environments. And those environments... I'm going to just rattle them off. Coasts, deserts, farmlands, forests, frontiers, grasslands, great cities, haunted lands, hellscapes, jungles, lands of the fae, mountains, open waters, underground, war-torn lands, and wild magic lands. So a whole broad-reaching, nigh-all-encompassing range of different types of environments that your characters might travel through as they're going from the starting point of the journey to the finishing point. And maybe in some journeys you might even hit more than one of these, right? And then you get 12 types of encounters for each of those different regional environments. You get chance meetings, hidden reserves, bump in the road, needing assistant, danger of foot, natural wonders, monster hunt, place to rest, old memories, dark place, deadly fight, 
and fateful encounters. So there's a ton of content here, a ton of different basically story seeds that you could use for these journeys. You know what? You could also use most of these to drive an entire adventure all on their own. So even if you don't want to use the book as its intended purpose for setting up this epic journey, you could just use it as a massive story seed archive for ideas for generating different one-shot yeah. adventures or different adventures to build into a campaign. Yeah, you could just use the settings that they have for you. Oh, no question. Uh, after that, there's the character sheet and a journey chronicle, which is basically just a character sheet for the journey as you're, tra as you're making the trip to chronicle everything that they encountered along the way. This is a chunky book. It's 290 pages. It is a hardcover. It is full color. The artwork inside I found to be extremely evocative as I was flipping through it, particularly for all of these different environments and the types of things that the characters can encounter along the way. It's from Cubicle 7. It is 50 bucks. We do have copies here on the shelf at Immortals Inc. or available at immortalsinc.com. Well said, John. Links in the description. Thank you guys for watching. Until next time, folks, good gaming.